Hello and welcome to PHA's first symposium. I'm Graham, the staff editor overseeing PHA Computer Science. This symposium is based on the software citation indexing and discoverability special issue, which was led by Dan Katz and Neil Chu Hong, who will both be presenting later on today. A quick piece of housekeeping, the Q&A function is available for all attendees. Please input all your questions through this and these will be read out to the presenter when they're ready for questions. We've got a great lineup of presenters for you and we'll jump straight into the first talk from David Schindler, who is a researcher from the University of Rostock. Just make you host. Thank you, Graham, and hello to everyone listening in. So let's get started. So a vast majority of scientists are using and requiring software for their research. Now it's important to know about when and how scientists use software. Because let's, for instance, consider the following case. What is if a bug is discovered in a research software? This would mean that potentially all research done with the help of the software could be biased. In this case, we would need to be able to alert all authors of the bug. And in the best case, all authors using a specific version of the software. And um, Sorry, I'm having a moment here. Um, so um, they would be able to update their software and check all the results and then make sure they were not influenced. But this is not the only case um, where, the, where knowledge about software and research is important, but there are actually many other cases where so um, just a second to check. Um, in what resolution do you see the slides? Because it appears that. Yeah, they're appearing yeah. fine. Um, are they appearing on a full page? Because um, in my view, they're actually, there's part of the slide missing. Yeah, there is part of the slide missing, David. Okay, so this is unfortunate. So maybe I can move to a different screen with another. Can you now see the full slide? Yes, now I can see the full slide correctly. Okay, um, sorry about this issue. So I was talking about knowledge about software and science. So there are several parties that might be interesting in knowing about where software is used. So consider the developer of a scientific software he might be interested in knowing where a software is reused, who the user community of the software is, and what impact the software has made. Now, another aspect are funders who financially support the creation of scientific software. Now, they are very interested in knowing what impact their funding has made. Researchers, on the other hand, need to know what software is available to them, so they can select the appropriate software for their needs and applications. Now, if they're already working with software, they also might benefit greatly from knowing about alternative software that might be even better suited to their needs. Now, from the perspective of reproducibility, software usage is a part of the researcher's provenance, as we have seen in the first example um, for a bit. And also scientific journals who demand proper software citation might uh, need this information to assess compliance with the journal policies. Now, if you know that this information is important, why don't we already have it? Now, the issue is that the information about software usage is hidden in scientific articles in the sense that the software use is not formally cited, but instead mentioned informally in the full text of scientific articles. So consider this example here from an article published in 2010. There's actually several software mentions in here, but only one of them is formally cited. So it would be very hard to extract all of those mentions. In this talk, I'm going to present our article, The Role of Software in Science, a knowledge graph-based analysis in software mentions in PubMed Central that was published in the PHA Special Issue on Software Citation, Indexing and Discoverability and that deals with 
how we developed a method to automatically extract information about software mentioned in scholarly articles. Now, the joint work with my colleagues Felix Benzmann and Stefan Dietze from Gieses, the Leibniz Institute for Social Sciences, and Frank Rüger from the Wismar University of Applied Sciences. Now, a brief outline of the talk. It will be structured in three main parts. So, first, I will talk about how software is mentioned in scholarly articles and all information relevant to it. Then, about the technical details. So, how our method for automatic extraction of this knowledge works. And finally, I will talk about the results of the analysis we performed. The talk will be about 25 minutes, leaving five minutes for questions. Now let's get started with the first part. So how software is mentioned in scientific articles. Now, first up, we have the software that is stated in the article. So here in the example, we have R that was mentioned because it was used for statistical analysis and creation of several figures. And here it's important to note that we are only considering software that is mentioned by name. So sometimes authors would use phrases like computer software or source code, and those generic terms we do not consider. In this example, there's also some further information about the software. So here, for instance, we have a version 3.2.2, which identifies the unique development state of the software that was used. And in this case, the authors also mention a developer, which we define as a personal organization involved in the development, maintenance, or documentation of a software. Here, the authors also inclu included a formal citation, so a real bibliographic reference connected to the software. So, uh, so this would be the 30th version of the corresponding article. It's also important to consider that all of this information is not there on its own, but in association to the software. That's why we add information relations that describe this relation, uh, indicated by the arrows in this example. And another piece of information we extract is the software type and mention type. So this is contextual information closer describing the software mention itself. So for the software type, we distinguish between an application. So a standalone software, this is what you usually think about when you hear the term software. So you would download it, install it, and then run it. But on the other hand, we have plugins. So this is software that is not intended to be run on its own, but in combination with another software. And it cannot actually work on its own, but it extends the function range of existing software. And we also have operating systems, which is a specialized form of software to manage computer hardware and processes running on it, and programming environments, which are used to create new software and execute them. Now, why is this important? For instance, when we perform targeted analysis, we might not be interested in operating systems and might want to exclude them. Another piece of information we are interested in is the mention type. So we distinguish between allusion. These are cases where an article is just mentioning software without adding any information on how the software relates to the article. While in contrast, a software usage would be a case where an article clearly states that software was applied and therefore is part of the researcher's provenance. Now, creation and deposition are cases where a new software was developed as part of a research with the difference that a deposition also means that the software was published. Now, in this case, we would classify R as software type application and mention type usage. Now, a more complex example, because now we have two different softwares here. The first thing you notice is that the previously obvious relation between additional information and software is not as clear as, as in this example, so it's more important here. And what we also notice is that there are two different types of software. One plugin, Klugo, and one application, Cytoscape. And they are also related. So we also add software relations between because Klugo is a plugin of Cytoscape. Now, this is basically all information that we extracted about software. 
aside from one major concept, the software identity. Now, every mention of a software in a scientific article obvious, obviously refers to one real-world software. So considering the four examples given here, we have the strings SPSS, statistical package for social sciences, software package for statistical analysis, and PASW statistic. All of those examples refer to the same real-world software, IBM SPSS statistics. So by the different names, um, in the first two cases, it's an abbreviation in the full name. In the third case, it's an error made by the authors. And in the last case, it's actually the most interesting one. This is due to company marketing because the software was sold under a different name in German speaking countries, at least for a while. So this is actually a rather complex issue. Now, with this, we have all information we want to know about software. Of course, we not only consider version developer and formal citation, but also other information such as a license or abbreviation or alternative names. But with that, we can move on to the second part, how we extracted all of this information automatically. Um, the first thing we need for that is a ground truth data set. And with that, we used SOMISI, which is short for Software Mentioned in Science. So this is a annotation we made in a prior work, and it's available from Zenodo and covers all the aspects I just described. It's manually annotated with the high data quality in terms of inter-annotator agreement with the respective value of kappa.82 and S score 0.93. It contains more than 1,300 articles, 3,700 software, and of course, all the other information. And it was quite costly to annotate with more than 480 hours spent on annotation time. If you're interested in using this data or just in the process of creating it, there's also an associated article that you can check out. So let's move on to the information extraction pipeline we developed based on this data set. So the first step is to extract software and all associated information. For this, we used a cybert model with multiple classification layers, which is depicted here on the bottom. And on the bottom left of the figure, we can see the shared layers, which are the cyber models, and above it and right to it, the three separate classification layers, which are responsible for recognizing entities. So software and associated information like the version. Then the second one is responsible for classifying the mention type and the last one, the software type. And they also share information between them hierarchically. Now we developed this model based on the SOMISA data set split into train development and test set, where the development set was used to tune hyperparameters and select the model. So we did not just um, come up with type word, but we tested different models, for instance, BLSTM CRFs, but also other bird based models with different sizes and complexities before finally deciding that Cybert was the best. The performance of the model was then tested on the previously untested and it achieves an F score of 0.88 for the recognition of software and for software and associated information an F score of 0.89. So the second step of our pipeline is to classify software and information relations. So to remind you, we have the example here and what we are interested in is predicting the connections between the individual information. For that, we consider all possible pair, um, connections between pairs of software and information and classify if there is a relation and if there is, which type it has. We did this by feature engineering and a random forest classifier. Again, this model was chosen based on hyperparent tuning and model selection, same as before, and it results in an overall F score of 0.94, where we have the, uh, the extraction of software relations actually works a bit worse with an S-score of 0.77. So the relation between Klugo and Tutoscape would be an example for a software relation. Another aspect that has to be mentioned here is that these values do not take error propagation into account. So errors in the first step, the information extraction, do influence the results of this step in practice. 
Now the third step of the pipeline is to extract um, is the software mention simulation. So again, we have an example of two mentions here. And what we would like to do is realize that they belong to the same software. Now, an approach that often chosen in problems like this is the simulation by linking to an external knowledge base, which is not possible in our case due to two issues. One is that we have insufficient coverage and general purpose knowledge bases. So, for example, in the SOMI SI dataset, only 23% of software are covered by Wikidata. So this is not, not enough to perform a linking on. Another issue is overcoverage. For example, in the Python package repository PyPy, um, we have more than 400,000 projects. And those include common software names that are not actually Python packages, um, such as Prism, ImageJ, ggplot, or LMA. So if you would link to this knowledge base without the prior knowledge that we're dealing with Python package, we would have a lot of false positives. So because this approach did not work for us, we decided to cluster all mentions referring to the same software instead. And we did this by feature engineering with a perceptron and an approximate nearest neighbor search. Though the method is again illustrated on the bottom. So for each pair of extracted software mentions, we create features such as string similarity, abbreviation, context similarity, or distance supervision by DBpedia, and use a perceptron to create one similarity value from this. Then we perform a customized approximate nearest neighbor search to cluster all mentions that belong together. Now, this approach achieves an S-score of 0.97. However, this is kind of hard to interpret because we noticed that with a larger data set, the clustering gets more complex. Though there is noise from the previous step, there's also semantic shift in software names over time. And overall, this leads to a very complex issue. And we added a quite exhaustive discussion of this in our article. So if you're interested in that, please have a look. Now, when we've done this integration, as a result, we know all mentions referring to the same real-world software. So in the example below, on the left, we have a lot of mentions, which all refer to one software. But what is still missing is information about the software, because we don't have an external link. So we don't know what the name of the software is. This is where the inference step comes in. So basically, we combine information from all individual mentions. And we also assign a confidence to this inference step that expresses a trust we have in this information. So in the example below, we would choose SPSS as the name because it's the most common one and assigning the confidence of 62.5%. Uh, now we don't only do that for the name, but also for the software type, the developer and all other information we think is interesting. And this basically covers the entire extraction pipeline. So we have entity recognition, relation extraction, and then finally the disintegration step. And we applied this pipeline on the PubMed Central Open Access subset. Now, this is a large scale data set of 3.2 million publications from more than 50,000 journals. That can, and the articles in the set can be divided into 27 major scientific domains. And we considered all articles published between 1990 and 2021 for our analysis. Now, great thing about this data set is the license that it has because um, all articles are available on open license, allowing republication. And another great thing is that all articles are available in XML format. This means that when we work with the data, we don't have to deal with PDF to text conversion and have no PDF conversion artifacts. Now, all information we extracted with our method based on this data set, we modeled in a knowledge graph, which has the benefit of allowing us a fair publication of the data and an unambiguous description. So the data is available as RDF triples. So the research description framework, which is also recommended standard by the W3C. To describe the data, we, de we also developed our own vocabulary. So the software GG, a vocabulary for describing software mentions in scientific articles, which is available from the GISIS website. Now within those 3.2 million articles, we found 22.1 million 
information strings that refer to software or some other information. And of those 22.1 million, 11.8 are software mentions, which disambiguated refer to 600,000 different software. Now, this covers all the data. And with that, I move on to the analysis we did based on this data set. Now, first off, I would like to talk about the most common statistical software in absolute and relative numbers and focus mainly on SPSS um, depicted here in orange and R depicted here in red. So those are the two most used softwares. And we see in absolute numbers that the mention of both software steadily rises over time while we can see in relative numbers that SPSS has actually been plateauing in the number of usage over the last six to seven years, while R has been on a steady rise. Though the rise in absolute number in SPSS is due to the higher amount of scientific articles that were published. Um, another thing we can see here is that there's actually a linking error in the data. So Python and Python, once in uppercase spelling and once in lowercase spelling, were not correctly linked. So looking at software usage over time in a more general sense, here we have two different lines. Blue is the relative amount of articles that use software and green is the number of software used per article, but only within articles that do use software. Now what we can see here is that there is not much software usage before 1997. And later on, we see a steep increase in software usage between 2001 and 2008, from less than 20% of articles using software to over 55% of articles using software. In the following time frame till 2021, we see that the software usage further increased steadily um, with over 70% in 2021. Now we can look at the same data, but not over time, but divided by scientific discipline. And here would only like to look at the highest and lowest cases. So on the right hand side, you have the disciplines, computer science, mathematics, agricultural science and decision science, where there are almost 80 or even more than 80% of articles using a software. And what's even more interesting is that in computer science, mathematics and decision science, the different software used per article is also really high with more than eight different softwares on average. On the other hand, we have the disciplines of arts and economics, where less than 40% of articles use software. And we have economics and dentistry, where only two softwares are used on average per article. Now, another aspect that has been of interest before is the completeness of software citation. So how much information is provided with the software. And here we looked at the software mentioned with the developer, a version, a version and a developer, and the amount mentioned with the former citation. So we're going to ignore the data before 1997 because there is too few points available. Um, but since 1997, we can see in light green, the software mentioned with the developer is steadily increasing, uh, decreasing, while the software mentioned with a version is steadily increasing. The software mentioned with both a version and a developer has been on the same level in the time frame. Now the software mentioned with the former citation, though this is a black line, has increased from 2000 to 2007 with a following slight decline and a stagnation ever since then. And the most important takeaway from this graph is probably that the um, completeness of software citation has not improved in the time over the last 10 to 15 years, at least not regarding format citation. Then again, looking at the same data split by discipline, um, we can see on the left hand side that we have the disciplines mathematics, decision science and computer science, who are very good at formally citing software, at least compared to other disciplines. And this is interesting because those were also the disciplines using the most software. 
On the other hand, we see that they provide very few informal information. So there are few mentions of versions and developers. On the other hand, we have an inverse trend when it comes to material science, nursing science and dentistry, where a very high amount of informal information is provided and a comparably low amount of formal citations, especially in dentistry where there are almost no formal citations. Now we performed several other analyses, for instance, considering the most important software per domain, um, common URLs associated with software, but also an analysis of the most important plugins, as well as software usage by journal rank. And if you're interested in that, so please check out the article. Now, before I come to my conclusion, I would like to talk about the limitations of our approach. So the first thing is that our analysis are all based on data from PMC, which leads to a selection bias. For one, we have a discipline bias towards medicine because PMC is mostly focused on medicine. Moreover, we have a publication bias because all articles are open access. Then another point that I have already mentioned is that error propagation is present in the information extraction, but was not included in the evaluation metrics. And that evaluation of entity disintegration has proven to be very difficult and that entity disintegration in general is a very complex issue. Now another thing that should be mentioned is that some analysis rely on external data. For instance, analysis based on journal rank, but also on scientific disciplines. So the analysis can only be as good as the external data. Now we created a lot of uh, a lot of resources during this work. One is the source code, including all analysis as a Jupyter notebook, which we have published at GitHub. Then we published all created data at Zenodo. And as mentioned before, we created a vocabulary, which is available from the GESIS website. We also added a short intro introduction on how to work with the data to get you quickly started if you want to perform some own analysis. So to summarize, um, we created a automatic recognition of software and associated information in scholarly articles and applied it on a large scale to PubMed Central. And we made all of the data available at Zenodo so you can work with it and gain some further insights into software and science. Now, those are the references I used for illustrating the software mentions. And this concludes my talk and I look forward to taking your questions. Great, thank you very much, David. That was a great talk. Um, I had a quick question actually on um, slide 23. Um, <clears throat> did you expect, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's one. Um, did you expect those results? Um, was, was, were, those the, were those sort of ordered in the ways that you were thinking? I mean, I, I might have expected that Python might have been um, a more popular statistical software to use. Um, we were expecting them, but then again, we did some previous analysis on the topic. And we also saw that in certain cases, R has actually overtaken SPSS as the most common software. And we previously knew that Python is not as common as the, the other software. So yes, we were expecting that, but we had some prior knowledge on the topic. Okay, thank you. And um, we've got a couple of questions from the attendees here. First one is from Alexander Struck, which is, um, I'm confused by this example citation of the R language on slide 11. The language offers a citation function which should be used and would look like this um, and that comes out as our core team 2022 in the title of our a language and environment for statistical computing uh, in the R foundation for statistical computing Vienna Austria with the URL underneath. Um, so are you referring to the citation I provided below here? Because um, this is not the citation for R, this is actually the citation for the article where the example is from. So um, we would actually need to look into citation 30 of this article and then look at what information is actually behind it. And that might very well be the um, proper R citation. But there are actually several ways 
um, people are citing R, so there is also not a clear one. We've only recently started working on citations and resolving them and looking at what information is actually provided inside the citations. Great, thank you. I think Daniel has a question as well. Hmm. Well, I have many, but I don't want to, I also want to make sure everyone else can ask their questions. So the first one um, that I have, if I may, is do you have any numbers on the adoption of uh, public uh, repositories and registries for software citations, such as, you know, as an auto for depositing uh, software and so on? Because after doing the, especially in the last years, you know, um, uh, I was wondering whether these are adopted in, in this domain or not, or maybe you don't know yet. Um, you mean how much um, those repositories were used or mentioned together with software? Or? Correct, yeah. Repository, public repositories like Zenodo that are commonly used for data, but increasingly for software too. Um, so the only analysis we did in that direction is that we looked at the most common URLs mentioned with software. And we found, of course, that GitHub is the most associated one, um, but also SourceForge, Gran, obviously, for our packages, but also Bioconductor for our packages. Um, but here in the example, there is actually no Zenodo, but Bitbucket and Google Code are actually even above Zenodo. So at least looking at the oh, URLs. I, I find this fascinating. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Um, I, I also have a, one quick question and, you know, in the last week I've been experimenting uh, with um, chat GPT, I, I, well, many of you may be familiar with it, and I've been giving it um, some sort of these texts asking for software mentions and so on, and, and it's incredible because it works pretty, pretty well. I was wondering if, if you are, uh, have you given it a try or, or not yet? Um, sorry, I didn't quite understand the name of the service you were. So OpenAI released uh, an assistant uh, in the last week that is, well, it's in the form of a chat, right? But I was testing this assistant and which is trained, it's not fair, right? Uh, the comparison is not fully fair because uh, they have trained with the full internet up until 2021. But I was, I was asking this, uh, this assistant to see whether it could detect some of the relationships that, or the entity disambiguation uh, tasks that you have mentioned in your talk. And it works really, really, really well. And I was just wondering if you had a comment on that or maybe you're not familiar with it yet. Um, I haven't, no, I haven't looked at it yet. So maybe I can take a look afterwards. So that also sounds very interesting. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, there are a couple more questions, but I think we should probably um, move on now. We might have a, have a chance later on for a sort of a discussion forum. But thank you very much, Davis. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a quick note before the next presentation. Um, we've got a promotion running at the moment, so you can receive a two hundred dollar discount off your APC of your next publication in PJ Computer Science. So if you email me at graham at pj .com, um, with the uh, quoting software symposium, the discount to be applied. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move on to to Daniel, G G sorry, Gajero, Giro, Gajero, Giro, distinguished researcher at the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid and co-chair of the Consortium of Scientific Software Registries and Repositories. Here we are. Thank you. I'll just make you host. All right. Thank you very much. And I'd like to, to apologize. Uh, sorry, Stefan. Sorry, Lindsay. I, I, I should have <laughs> I took some time from your questions. <laughs> um, so let me see. Um, I I cannot share my screen. Are you sure you promoted me? No? Uh, yes, you should be able to see. Sorry. Uh, yes. Nope, I cannot share my screen. Sorry. Um, I'll pull the slides up here. Okay, that works. Sure. 
Um, maybe you ah, need to make there we go. Push. Should be able to okay. now. There you go. Sorry about that. All right. Can you see my screen right now? Yes. Excellent. All right. So uh, my name is Daniel Gar Gar Garrigio, not Gajiro. <laughs> That's fine. It's a complex uh, surname sometimes. And um, uh, today I am I'm presenting some work on my own, but it's on behalf of all the uh, consortium for, for software registries and repositories, the Psycodes Consortium, because it's a uh, work that we did all co collaboratively. By no means, this is my own contribution. And the work that we did is nine best practices for uh, research software and uh, registries and repositories that well we discussed for a long time, as you will see in a second. And before, before entering and, and talking just about the practices that we did, I wanted to provide a little context. I know that many of you may be familiar with uh, the FAIR principles for data. Uh, FAIR stands for uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Basically, findable, that means to make your data findable in the web. Accessible, that means that you should make it accessible through a, a known uh, protocol such as HTTP, HTTPS, interoperable means that you should describe your data with appropriate metadata so others can consume it. And reusable means that you should provide licensing permissions so others can reuse it, provide documentation and provenance so others can understand your data, right? And in the context of the FAIR principles, um, well, initially they were triggered uh, for, not triggered, they were tailored for data. But now, since 2016, there has been a lot of discussion from the community towards adapting the FAIR principles for software, for semantic artifacts, for scientific workflows, and for many research outputs that have been created by the community. All right, so in that context, um, many, many software repositories and registries have been created for the community to help scientists make their data and other resources such as software fair, right? And the problem with that is that sometimes scientists can get a little bit confused because, okay, uh, now I have the repositories and registries for the code that are uh, completely generic of any domain, but I also may have the ones that are uh, particularly tailored for my community. And then I may have others that um, people are talking about. So which ones uh, should I use, right? And from the repository owner's point of view and the registry owner's point of view, there is this question of how can I uh, convince people to register the resources in my platform and spend time uh, making sure that they populate it and they curate the metadata appropriately, uh, appropriately right? Also, there is this uh, question about the metadata. So if people want to put their resources in these registries, how do, make sure, how do we make sure that they interoperate? So if uh, they, we need to propagate resources from one platform to another, we don't make users have to uh, spend their time again and again, populating their entries in platforms that they don't know whether they can trust or not, right? So, with this and other questions, we had a workshop in 2019. I highlighted here in, I hope you can see my mouse, but here in the top uh, right of the figure, you can see the, some of the organizers, Alice and Tom, and in the top and the bottom left, there is Mike. So uh, they organized a workshop around software repositories and registries with the goal of discussing what were the common issues for managers of these resources, uh, to finalize a list of best practices and also to cooperate towards the adoption of standards that were arising from the community back then to describe scientific software or research software and uh, standards for citations such as the citation file format which is one that has now been adopted even by GitHub and it's I think last time I checked there were more than 20,000 uh, projects in GitHub that now have CFF files. So the idea was having this workshop and, and, and collaborate all together. Um, the resources that participated in this workshop 
well, we had more than 14 people that they, but they were representing up until, up, uh, up until like uh, 14 participating resources. And these resources were a little heterogeneous, right? They were all targeted towards software, but some had accepted other deposits like uh, from data as well. For example, we have people from Zenodo. Um, some were discipline specific, like for example, Alice's resources, astrophysics, but there were others that they were uh, generic, like SciCrunch. And um, some require a software deposit, that means that they were uh, repositories, while the others were only accepting metadata, that meant that they were registries, right? Some could mint their own DOIs, and some had, well, the majority actually had curation, some sort of curation. Here by other, it means that they did not have manual curation, but maybe they had some automated tests to ensure that certain minimum metadata was uh, filled by authors when, when creating their submissions. And many of them were also very concerned about software citation because in fact, this was um, a, a, a group that was derived from the Force 11 Citation and Implementation Working Group. I think this group uh, was from 2018 and then we had the, the workshop late in 2019. And this is just to, to, to share with you all the process that, that we followed in order to come up with the practices, that it's not something that it came up in one day. It was a process that was heavily discussed. The workshop was, I think, the kickstart point. And then we had like an archive reporting almost in late 2020. And finally, the PRJ uh, paper that we, we have published as part of this special issue, once the Cycots Consortium has been um, has been created because the Force 11 Citation and Implementation Working Group ended up, um, well, it was, I think it was quite successful. And uh, now many of the resources that were there, the, we, we decided to transition into the Net Consortium. So through all this time, we held, I think, meetings once or twice a month, depending on what we needed to discuss. And an important part of the agenda was the practices that I'm going to show you uh, right now and basically well we wanted to make sure that everyone was okay with it so there was a lot of community involvement and discussion until we agreed on the nine best practices that i'm about to show right now so uh, i'm gonna give you an overview of the practices of course you have more import uh, more information in the paper and note that i'm gonna be talking about software registries and repositories as resources because software registry and repository is a little bit difficult to say a lot of times very quickly in a row. And I, I'll just say resources. So I just wanted to clarify that before continuing. So the practices are as follows. The first one is to make sure you provide, if you are considering creating a new resource or, or if you already have one, provide a public scope statement or stating what is the criteria of the, that the tools have to follow in order to be acceptable in your resource and also listing exceptions to this criteria. So for example, here I'm showing um, an instance of the ASL.net, which is the astrophysics source code library, where it says clearly that the entries that are accepted as part of their resource are peer reviewed astronomy, um, software entries that are in peer reviewed astronomy or astrophysics research, or that have been submitted for review or that part of someone else, uh, someone's thesis, right? The next one is to provide guidance for users. Why? Well, because it's not enough to just create a resource. It's important that users can use it. Otherwise, um, the findable aspect that remains quite not accomplished, right? So you have to explain how users can search over the resource, how can others can browse the, the content of a given entry, what are the frequently asked questions, point of contact, and if you have machine readable APIs, how can one consume them, right? Here I'm showing um, one uh, a snippet of one of the resources as well, which I think it's very well documented, which is the BioTools registry. And they have a usage, a very extensive usage, usage guide that you can browse as an example in this URL over here. By the way, my slides are open and, and I think I can share them in the chat afterwards. The third one is to provide guidance to software contributors. 
So before it was for users, now it's for people who want to submit their entries. So we, you have to clearly state who is allowed to submit entries and metadata. So for example, if I have not created a software tool, but I want to find it or let others find it in a platform, am I, uh, am I allowed to upload it or not? No. And also which required an optional metadata are you expecting from contributors? You have to state what is the review or curation process, if any, and who can update a, a record. For example, if someone else has registered my tool in their platform, will I be able to uh, change the description in case I detect errors, right? An example that I'm pasting here is from the computational infrastructures for geodynamics review uh, resource, which, uh, which indicate what is the type of metadata and what should a readme file, because this is managed through GitHub, and what uh, people should include in the readme files when they are submitting uh, new entries to that resource. Next one is to establish an, out an authorship policy, no? And basically it's explaining um, what do you consider to be proper contribution or who are you expecting to uh, provide credit as a, as a contributor of a software tool. So for example, if, I don't know, if I, I get the tool from someone else and I upload it into a registry, I am probably not going to be a contributor. That's not going to be considered enough, right? So you have to make sure that all these caveats are considered, especially when conflict resolution processes arise. And I think, well, I do not personally have a lot of stories here, but Alice Allen has quite a few of uh, problems that she had to deal with by contacted authors because some of these things were sometimes not very clear. Here is an example from the uh, Journal of Open Source Software, which is not technically an, uh, res a resource, a part of the consortium, but we thought it was very cool because here you have uh, clearly specified who can and who, who is and who is not considered a contributor of an entry um, or a valid submission as part of the journey. The next one is to uh, clearly document your uh, metadata schema. Because, you know, one of the exercises that we did that as part of the workshop was trying to discuss whether among all the resources that were present, all the 14 resources, we had exactly the same meaning for each of the metadata schemas that we were using. And it turned out that I think except the name and maybe the description, there were none other fields that that meant exactly the same. Why? Well, because, um, I don't know, um, maybe when I ask for creator, I, I understand that uh, I'm also included in the contributors while others are also only considering the creators, or maybe someone is expecting a name or an orchid, or, you know, there are different formats in which this can be collected. And, uh, well, it's very important to document all these things up. So you have to state what does each metadata field mean, so authors also don't get confused. And uh, you, you should provide examples of the existing entries and the format that you expect the, uh, the values of each of these collection forms to have, because otherwise you are probably going to have a bad time. So, um, an example that I put here is uh, the ontosoft.org slash software uh, ontology, which is, uh, which is uh, an example vocabulary that can be used for, uh, for sharing software descriptions. Next is stipulating the conditions of use. And basically, this, is, this means what can others do with the contents of the site. This is very important now that we are also leaning towards uh, adopting the common metadata standards, because this means that maybe there can some someone can do crawlers to get some of the metadata of the entries. And well, some registries, some resources may be okay with that, but maybe some others are not, right? Because uh, responsibility, liabilities, license and copyright from the entries or from the metadata. So also, in the conditions of use, you should uh, state how do you expect to, uh, people to cite the entries in the registry and how should the registry itself be cited by others. 
Um, a good example that we found was the, uh, here from the US Department of Energy, where you have an acceptable use policy, but basically you want to create uh, crawlers to get all the information from the website and from the resource, then you have to ask for permission explicitly, otherwise you are not able to do so. Next is stating a privacy policy, which at least in Europe is increasingly important if you want to be compliant with the GDPR, right? Uh, stating whether any personal data is, uh, is collected or used, and uh, stating whether there are any cookies or analytics uh, saved as part of your resource, and which information is collected from users in general. For example, very typical one, and probably the most uh, personal information may be the, the email, right? And also how long will it be stored, especially if uh, someone is deleting uh, their, their user or they are deleting their software. Um, are you keeping that information for some reason or, or are you not? And here is an example from SciCrunch, which is also one of the resources that participated in the, in the workshop that states what is the privacy policy uh, for all the websites that you propose. Next is providing a retention policy. Basically, what happens if an entry needs to be removed? For example, it is deprecated, it is outdated, or maybe there was something wrong and the authors uh, want uh, have detected a, a fatal flaw with their <laughs> research software and they want an entry to be completely removed. So you have to specify if you are if you are expecting to retain some information under what condition is this acceptable and also who, who can remove an entry, right? Especially if, I don't know, if someone else registered my tool in their platform, can I ask for my tool to be removed or do I have to, uh, to, to be an active contributor of the entry of that tool? What, what process is there to remove? And an example that we found from the Bioconductor uh, website is the package of end of life policy that they have, where they clearly state that if a software package has not been maintained uh, uh, in more than one year, I think, then they, uh, and if it, that package does not comply anymore with the quality criteria of the website, then they might remove it. They may remove it from, from the website completely. And the final one, the final practice is the, to disclose the end of life policy, which is tricky, right? Because uh, maybe none of the people that are managing a resource would like to think about what, hap what would happen if that resource would end up to, to cease existing. So, but as an author, this is critical, no? Because if you are contributing to a resource, you want to make sure that that resource is not gonna just disappear in two years, or, or if it happens, what is going to be the plan for that? So what are the circumstances that may, uh, that may make a resource disappear? For example, lack of funding. I, don't, I, cannot, uh, I cannot have my, or maybe, I don't know, the main maintainer or curator of the resource uh, is retiring and nobody else want to, wants to take over, no? So what are the consequences and whether there is a plan B to make sure that the um, metadata that has been collected so far is going to be sustained in, in the long term. Uh, one uh, example that I really like is the one from Zenodo, where um, they ask, is my data safe with you? What would happen to my uploads in the event that Zenodo has to close? Well, they say that, that basically they are receiving data from CERN, sorry, they are receiving funding from CERN, and therefore it's very unlikely for this to stop, to, to stop but uh, that, that they have the means to basically hold all this all the information that they have in Zenodo in certain servers for at least uh, the next 20 years. Um, they don't specify exactly how this would happen, but at least they specify that, uh, that they, they are covered somehow. All right, so these are the nine best practices, right? Um, as, as you can see, some of these are a little bit general. We don't want to dig in into domain specific practices because otherwise they would not be uh, easy to adopt by other, other uh, registries and repositories. And also we didn't want to be the practices to be very constraining. So these are prescriptive, something that you can do um, and that we really, really recommend doing in order to increase adoption.
But then the question is, okay, well, here are the practices that we are suggesting, but how many of the resources that participated in the workshop adopted them? And um, this is um, a figure that summarizes the amount of resources that are adopting each practice. Unfortunately, um, since this survey was an anonymous survey, I'm not in the liberty of discussing the specific details of uh, you know, who, uh, who adopts what exactly or which resource adopts what exactly, but you can see that, that the most popular ones are the providing public scope statement and, and instructions both for users and for developers are very highly adopted. Also providing some sort of metadata schema for the APIs of the resource. And where we need a little bit more work is in the authorship policy, the retention policy, and the end of life policy associated with each of these resources. Since we created the, since we had the first workshop, we have been growing up slowly. Now we are part, as I said, as the Psychodes Consortium, uh, which is the public consortium of scientific software registries and repositories. And now we are up to 30 resources, uh, which uh, maintain the heterogeneity in terms of domain specificness and that. And also uh, many of them are heavily curated right well with with some of them having automated tests for it so here is just uh for your, for your reference um kind of the types of repositories that accept software and uh right now what we are doing is having um one monthly discussion with uh, all the attendees that can make it to that meeting for all the resources and we are uh, sharing um easy, still sharing issues and still sharing um, what are the guidelines to make sure that uh, people can adopt some of these best practices. We are also measuring whether this is slowly increasing across time. So that's, I think that's all I wanted to, to, to tell you. So um, this is a summary of the practice again to, that I'm not gonna reread um, because in the interest of time, I would, uh, I would recommend like having a look at the, at the paper if you, if you want more information. And if you're thinking about creating a new resource or if you have one and you are curious on how to implement or uh, get additional examples or even help on how to implement some of these practices, I would, I would recommend you joining the discussion. Also, we are um, now discussing how to, how to enforce the, the, you know, the adoption of st community standards such as CFF and, and, um, and code meta, which extend, well, code meta in particular extends schema.org to make sure that we have a common um, vocabulary for sharing software entries and software metadata. And with that, I would like to uh, leave the space for questions. And or, or maybe if you if you want questions for the uh, prior speaker that I took the time. <laughs> so anyway. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, I did have a quick question on them. So the, the retention policies and authorship policies seem to be the, le the least frequently implemented. Um, why do you think that is? Do you think there are any main reasons for that? Well, if you ask, I, I don't, I'm not sure why the privacy and retention policy, in some cases it's because, you know, people that have the resources have, have not even uh, thought about this, and, you know, when you create the resources like, oh, I'm already going to be thinking on what's going to happen when the funding goes away, right? And in some cases, you know, it, some of these experiences come after having the resource going on for a few years. So then the, uh, the, the hence it's I think it's valuable to come and share it uh, or come and, and and share some of these experiences as part of the community because that's when you realize hey wait maybe I should add one of those no but I don't think I can give you a good explanation of what this is missing beyond the um, the maybe awareness okay cool thank you and um, we had a question from Lindy Anderson. Um, it would be interesting to see what additional software attributes, attribute analytics can be extracted from software friendly repositories such as Zenodo, who use, who allow users to leverage linked vocabularies, SDO, SWO, ITO, AIO, etc. for mm -hmm. tagging software specific entity uploads. 
filtering assets. Are, are you able to see this as well, by the way? So, <laughs> okay, so uh, filtering assets from the entities defined in the model schema based on prefix, selected prefix IDs, uh, PURLs, assigned to DOIs for use case search and reuse discovery. Not sure if that is feasible, but it does rely on citing the software to begin with, I, I suppose. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you know, um, one of, uh, I think one of the big problems that I think they have right now with uh, some of these general purpose repositories is that they have a lot of entries, which is great, but uh, sometimes they don't know about the insights of those entries very well. So for example, in, in OpenAir, which uh, it's one of the aggregators for, for Zenodo, they they have the this tag for software but many of the entries they don't even know whether they are really software or not so doing some uh, extraction analysis like what you're proposing is indeed one of the things that they are currently working on i hope that answered the question more or less thank you um, okay so we'll, we'll move on now um thank you very much daniel uh, so now we have Dr. Lauren Codwallader, who is Open Research Manager at the nonprofit profit publisher PLOS, who will be presenting her talk, What Can We Learn from Author and Reader Perspectives About Shared Code? Thank you, Lauren, over to you. Great, thank you. Hopefully you can see my slides okay. Um, uh, so as Graham said, I'm uh, Lauren Codwallader, I'm the Open Research Manager at PLOS. And for those of you who don't know PLOS, it's a non-profit open access publisher. We publish about 12 journals within the life and medical sciences. And because we're non-profit, we can really be like a, a mission-based publisher. And one of the key things at PLOS that we look at and we want to work on is open science. And this uh, drives a lot of the work that I do. So uh, when we think about open science and we're trying to lead, lead a kind of change in open science, you know, we're thinking about various values and how we can really facilitate kind of changes and behaviours uh, for researchers who want to practice open science. And you can see the underlying values uh, on this slide. And I'd just like to highlight the bottom one of community and collaboration. So a lot of the work that we do to try and facilitate open science at PLOS is really focusing on kind of community needs and what actually we can do to work with the community and help the community in order to help them achieve open science. So uh, I'd like to give a, a bit of background to, to the work I'm going to talk about today. In um, 2020, we were working on a couple of initiatives to do with uh, coaching. So the first one was um, around consultation about a proposed mandatory co-chairing policy of PLOS computational biology. Uh, this is kind of con consultation with our editorial board, as well as researchers working in the field. And at the same time, in a kind of related but not completely integrated uh, piece of work, we're also experimenting with a Canadian open science group called Neurolibre to look at code notebooks and how they might uh, kind of fit into computational biology research and, and what they might look like, and what they might offer or so as part of that work, I, I talked to a lot of researchers and the kind of things that I started hearing from them were kind of the kind of sentiments that as an author, they thought this about code sharing, but as a reader, they had other ideas about how they would prefer code to be shared. And to be honest, I wasn't entirely expecting to have these two different sides presented. And so this kind of difference between what authors want and what readers want informed kind of the subsequent work that we carried out in 2021 uh, and again two kind of related but not completely enmeshed pieces of work one was a survey around uh, code notebooks so kind of an extension of this work we were doing with Neil Louis Bay to really understand a bit more about code sharing uh, tools essentially uh, and then a couple of months later we introduced a mandatory code sharing policy at plus computational biology to try and increase code sharing and the thing I want to talk about today and uh, that we wrote up and had published in PAJ is this survey to investigate code sharing and notebooks. So what did we do? Well, we had this goal. We wanted to work out whether it was worth spending time as a publisher on code sharing solutions. So things like notebooks or maybe executable research articles uh, as a way to increase code sharing. Uh, our goal, real goal was to kind of increase the proportion of articles that were sharing code. And so we wanted to work out if we 
uh, if by introducing some kind of tool that would really facilitate that new policy that we had introduced. So we surveyed researchers in the computational biology field um, and we asked them about how they like to access code as readers of articles. So why do they access the code? And what are their preferred methods for looking at that code? We also asked the, for their opinions on a prototype notebook uh, created by Neurolabre. And we also asked them about their practice when they share code as an author of a research article. Uh, so we asked them about uh, various code sharing tasks and how satisfied they were with their ability to carry them out and also how important they thought those tasks were. Uh, we asked them about the time spent on code sharing tasks and about their willingness to use a new tool. So uh, a bit more on this kind of survey. When we talk about code sharing in this context, we talked uh, the kind of the, the phrasing we use was code associated with research articles. We kind of left it, I guess, slightly uh, vague so that respondents could think about the, the code shared alongside articles within the context of, of their own research. So we didn't want to be too prescriptive about how we describe that to make the uh, survey kind of as broad in, in scope for respondents as possible. We shared the survey via email and on social media and it ran in February, and March last year. And we had 188 complete responses. So to some results, uh, so some demographics to start with. I mean, this was intentionally aimed at kind of computational biology researchers, and you can see they make up about a third of the respondents we had. We also had really good representation from bioinformatics and biology and life sciences field, and about a third of the other respondents were from various fields. I think this is, you know, important to bear in mind when we think about the the kind of the conclusions we draw from the survey and that how they're quite specific to this field and we shouldn't kind of extrapolate them out necessarily to other fields. We asked respondents how many papers they published as a kind of way to gauge their career stage. Uh, and we got respondents from kind of across the spectrum from zero to five papers to more than a hundred papers. And it was more kind of weighted towards that early, what we think of as kind of early to mid career uh, researchers who are you know, still um, publishing kind of a smaller number to kind of, a, I guess, like a medium number of papers. And we asked respondents where they were from. Uh, and so you can see from, from these stats that, again, the survey results are heavily biased towards North America and Europe. So again, just all things to bear in mind when we think about how we can apply the findings from the survey to other cohorts. So first of all, we asked about readers uh, of code. So how, you know, what do you think about, why do you re look at code when you're reading a scholarly article? So first of all, we asked how often do you look at the code? Uh, and I'm pleased to say most people look at some code at least some of the time. That's reassuring when your job is all about getting people to share code that, you know, it's confirmed that people will then go and look at that code. It's a really nice uh, data point to have. So we can see that, uh, you know, there are varying levels of uh, how often people look at code. And we asked, why do you look at code? And I tried to make a word uh, cloud here of some of the more common uh, responses. And this was a free text field, so uh, respondents could write anything they like and give as many reasons as they like. And so when I went through and kind of categorized these and 70%, so they look a code shared alongside an article to really aid their understanding of the article. So there were lots of comments about method sections not being uh, in enough detail. So we would have to go and look at the code to try and really understand what was done, you know, the parameters that we used, etc. Just under half wanted to reuse the code in some way. Uh, and that included reuse, um, for example, where someone said, I really like the way that they presented their results. Uh, so I want to reuse the, their code when they created a figure because I'd like to present my results in the same way. You know, to reusing the code to uh, run in uh, kind of a model someone else is building, for example. About a fifth of respondents look at the code to assess quality of the research. So the idea being, you know, if the code looks of good quality, the research is probably good quality and therefore more well trustworthy. Only about 16% of respondents actually wanted to rerun the code. And this figure uh, aligns with what other studies have found about how often people want to rerun the code. So there isn't a whole lot of uh, kind of desire of readers to actually rerun the code itself. It's more kind of looking at the code, exploring the code, seeing which bits might be useful. 
And then finally, kind of a very small percentage, three uh, percent, want to discover new code or methods. So they're just really interested in finding GitHub repositories that might be of interest or use further down the line. So we asked them also how useful are different sharing methods to you as a reader, and we presented them with a variety of options uh, for them to rank. And we also asked how often they had encountered these methods. Uh, so uh, we calculated kind of mean usefulness scores for these different methods, and the most useful method seems to be code shared in a code repository such as GitHub. And we also found that 98% of respondents had encountered code shared this way. So that seemed like a kind of firm favorite and the, a community norm for code sharing. And then the kind of the next most useful methods seem to be a link to archive code and a repository such as Zenodo or a code notebook. And uh, kind of like the, the next level down in usefulness, if you like, seems to be a link to a website like a lab group website. Uh, or an executable code uh, capsule and article, which actually hadn't been encountered that often. So that kind of might um, change the perception of that slightly. And we asked them, why did you find these methods useful, right? And the kind of, I guess these can be separated into two groups. The first group all speak to best practice around code sharing and I mean, even data sharing. So they found these methods useful for things like versioning, good documentation, long-term access, all things, you know, that uh, uh, signals and markers of well-shared code. And then the next group of responses really kind of speak to what they wanted to do with that code when they found it. So the code was really easy to access, you, know, you just had to click on a link, it was there, for example. It was really easy to explore the code, it helped, you know, help with that exploration element, and it allowed for the reproduction of results. And that a specific point was made in reference to code notebooks most often. We also showed those uh, respondents, uh, those prototype notebooks, uh, and asked them which features they found most useful as readers. And the two that really stood out from that question were things like having the code and data in the same place and knowing that it was in the right environment when you were running that code. So moving on to what authors think about shared code now. Um, we asked them about a bunch of code sharing tasks and we asked them to rate how important they were and how satisfied they were with their ability to do that. And we use this methodology because from that we can calculate what we call opportunity scores. Uh, and then when we plot them on a graph, such as you see here, we can work out where, where there are opportunities to introduce a new tool or solution that the respondents are likely to adopt. Because if respondents are kind of satisfied with their ability to carry something out, they're probably not going to change their behavior or they're not going to be motivated enough to go and change their behavior. So the idea is that if a uh, data point pops in the top left of this uh, graph, then that's a really good opportunity for us to introduce something and we researchers would be willing to change their behavior. They've been motivated enough to, uh, to use that tool. Uh, and as you kind of move towards the right of the graph and and uh, downwards, you know, that opportunity becomes less and less. And there's that kind of region for what we consider a marginal opportunity. So it might work, maybe not, you know, there might be enough motivation, but maybe not for researchers to change their behavior. So the two tasks that fell into to that group were that um, authors were not entirely satisfied with their ability to make sure that readers can easily uh, run the code in the correct environment. And they were also not quite satisfied with their ability to make sure the data and the code are in the same place. And this is really interesting uh, because it really marries well with what readers find important. Readers find these two things really important and authors are struggling a bit with getting those right. So that's, that's a really nice uh, kind of merging of the data there, right? So it kind of suggests that there's a really nice opportunity there to help researchers out. Well, I guess the question is, how do we do that? So uh, before we get into that, just one uh, more thing we asked authors, and that was about the time they were willing to spend on, uh, possibly on a new tool to possibly make their code kind of easier for readers to, to read and run. So yeah, this is really about the author doing something for, for that unknown reader. Uh, and in the context of the survey, the kind of tools we've been talking about were notebooks and executable research uh, capsules. 
And so from this graph, we can, you know, if you add up the different bars, we can see that about two thirds of respondents say they'd only be willing to spend a day or less on a new tool, which isn't, you know, great amount of time. And we have about a third of respondents saying that they'd spend more than a day. But actually, if you look at that by the amount of time they're already spending prepping their code, which was another question we asked, the authors who are already spending quite a lot of time prepping their code are, are the ones willing to spend even more time. So it seems that there's this kind of core group of researchers who are really invested in preparing their code and doing it well, and they would be willing to use a tool uh, and spend time on that new tool. But the majority of researchers would only give it maybe an extra day or less of their time. So what have we learned from this survey data? Well, we've learned that readers really prefer to access code via repositories such as GitHub. Uh, but they do think running the code in the right environment and having it together with the data is really important. And of course, like in a GitHub repository, you could put the data and code together and that works, but you know, you can't guarantee that uh, others can run it in the correct environment. So we've got a slight kind of mismatch of what readers want or what they like to do at the moment and what they think is important. Authors also think uh, this is important, the, having the code in the right environment and the code together with the data. And there is a marginal opportunity to support that. But otherwise, they're pretty satisfied with how they uh, share code and their ability to do that, uh, which, you know, indicates that they wouldn't necessarily be motivated enough to change their behavior if they're generally satisfied overall with how they share code. So th then we kind of come back to the goal of the survey, trying to work out whether a code sharing tool or solution could ultimately increase code sharing. So we're thinking about, could that tool or solution meet the needs of researchers? And would that in turn increase the amount of code that was shared by people publishing with cross computational biology. So when we think about those needs of the researchers from the survey, you know, there was that very clear direction that researchers really value um, having that code in the right environment, having it together with the data. But they also prefer those repositories. And actually they mainly just want to uh, understand the methods of the article, right? So they just want to, read through that code essentially they're not really looking to rerun that code there's not that strong desire to um to be able to interact with that code necessarily you know at the point where they're looking at it and i think it's worth bearing in mind that you know new tools or solutions might require new skills or new behaviors from our authors and you know that's quite a big ask in the scholarly system when there's lots of other time and pressure uh, on people and this can be really time and labor intensive. So uh, Nature Journals ran a pilot with CodeOcean who uh, kind of facilitate those executable research articles. And they found that uh, the amount of time it took to kind of generate one of those capsules was nine days, uh, kind of on average. And nine days is a long time, you know, especially when we're looking at two thirds of our respondents saying they wouldn't spend more than a day on a new tool. OK, so there's that kind of mismatch between what people are willing to spend in terms of time and what kind of these tools actually require. So it's really not looking like these tools are going to meet enough of those needs or, you know, that the, the positives really outweigh the negatives and that there isn't a really kind of big uh, incentive for those researchers to use them. I do think it's also worth bearing in mind the other things that these uh, tools can, can offer. And really uh, the kind of two big ones are increasing reproducibility, which you know I'm sure we all agree is super important. And also facilitating peer review, actually, you know, if the code is there and it's super easy to run for someone else, then that helps peer reviewers to uh, look at the code whilst they're assessing a paper, and it can really improve that peer review process. There are questions on how much these tools kind of facilitate peer review uh, versus, you know, just providing, say, a GitHub link. Uh, I don't think there's kind of any strong evidence uh, or kind of studies been done that's uh, given kind of data on that. And of course, there's also that question of, are these tools really going to increase code sharing? They might increase the quality, that's, that's for sure, but they might not increase the absolute numbers. And that's really still data that we're, we're yet to see and that we would really like other publishers to share who are, who are um, using these tools and, you know, 
we would encourage them to help everyone learn from that. So how can we increase code sharing if we don't think uh, these tools and solutions are necessarily going to work for our community? Well, we've opted for a policy approach, and this wasn't really community driven. This uh, idea came from our editors in chief. There was a lot of support on the editorial board. Uh, and so when we, you know, we can see that there's already a high level of code sharing kind of before we introduced the policy, and that was organically increasing anyway. But after our policy implementation, the, the rate of code sharing really increased. And uh, it's worth pointing out it's a lagging indicator because it affects uh, articles on submission and of course there's you know, it takes a number of months from submission to publication when we would expect to see those articles affected by the mandatory policy published. So we've gone for this approach, seems to be working uh, well enough for now. But what's next for PLOS and co-chairing? Well, we're going to continue to monitor the effectiveness of a policy-based approach uh, to increase co-chairing. And that's really important to make sure that policy works with people and make sure that they understand and they, you know, do have the information that they need to share code in, in, a, in the way that we require them. And you know, that might need some facilitation through things like tools that we can suggest or um, best practice for, for code sharing and making sure that their code is fair. But we also want to stay involved in conversations around code sharing tools, especially around notebooks and executable research articles because we think they're really important they offer a really interesting kind of avenue for presenting research and for presenting code as an output that's really usable and as we think about how the kind of scholarly landscape evolves you know this might be a really potential uh, interesting avenue to think about how we uh, give credit and reward for different outputs coming out of research and of course, we want to monitor that community uptake and attitudes towards co-chairing. As I said at the beginning, you know, the community are kind of our real focus for a lot of this work. And we want to make sure anything that we implement works for them. So if you know, they all suddenly start adopting notebook, you know, we want to make sure that we can respond to that and that we do respond to that. And of course, we'll be looking at other communities that we set in class and working out perhaps some of these tools are better suited to their needs rather than computational biologists. So this isn't plus writing off code sharing tools as a way to facilitate and increase code sharing at our journals, but we're just saying it's not for us right now. So if you want to uh, kind of read some more of that research and uh, get all the references to things I've been uh, talking about, uh, our articles on PJ. We share the data set as well, which includes all the survey data plus the survey instrument, if you're ever interested in kind of rerunning those types of questions in a, in a different research group. Uh, and that's uh, all I wanted to say. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> So yeah, the publishers definitely have a role to play in the promotion of research software. And it's great to see publishers taking on open data policies. So this really facilitates the reproducibility of research. Um, on the, I think it's the second to last slide, or sorry, third to last maybe, um, you it looks as though the code sharing practice, sorry, the, the code-based, try that again, the policy-based approach appears to have a positive effect on code sharing practices. Um, do you think there's likely to be a ceiling for this? So it looks as though it was approaching sort of 90, 90 odd percent, um, uh, 85 percent. Do you think there's going to be a ceiling to this? And what do you think are the remaining barriers preventing people from uh, sharing their code? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. As part of the work we did to assess the code sharing rates of computational biology, we worked with uh, a company called Datasphere who um, do kind of natural language processing and really kind of uh, analyze the articles to try and work out the number of articles generating code as well, so that we could put those sharing rates in context of um, those uh, generating those sharing. Uh, with computational biology, we found, I think it's something like 99% of articles uh, generate code, and that's because we don't really publish theoretical papers, so we'd expect there to be, you know, a, a lot of original code generated. Um, you know, I do think that there's perhaps going to be uh, a ceiling we reach at some point that isn't going to be 100% because, you know, there are always people who are slightly resistant to, to sharing their outputs. And, you know, as much as we, we kind of 
instruct our editors and our, and our staff to make sure that things are, are shared and that they do checks, things always fall through the gaps, right? And, you know, there are exceptions allowed, you know, if code can't be shared for kind of legal or contractual ethical reasons, that's okay. Um, and, you know, we uh, encourage people to submit and just, you know, explain those reasons and, you know, we'll be reasonable about that. So I do think there will always be a kind of uh, a shortfall in, in people sharing code, but I like to think that this community, you know, are really embracing code sharing and, and are kind of leading the way. And, and so we'll we'll get near to sort of 100%, I hope. <laughs> That's good. It's definitely a very positive trend. And um, so there was a question from one of the attendees. Uh, can you clarify the difference between reusing the code and rerunning the code listed under the reader's results? Yeah, sure. Uh, by rerunning, uh, I, I mean, um, I guess like uh, completely just rerunning the code with the data using the article. So that kind of replication of trying to you know, reproduce those results uh, that are in the article, whereas reusing is kind of taking snippets of code and, and kind of putting them into your own work. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if any of the other panelists have any questions they wanted to ask. No, okay. Um, well, so we have um, a couple of minutes before um, before the next. Oh, sorry, Neil. There you are. Hi, Lauren. Thank you for that. Um, uh, my question is going to be: Having now done all of this work and this uh, this study, do you think that you have any sort of experiences, lessons learned, and how you might persuade other? journals and publishers to do something similar you know how, would you change anything would you would you refine the question set yeah that is a good question i think i refine the question set in a couple of ways i think um it we didn't necessarily define certain things like uh, executable code capsules which you know and they had the lowest rate when we asked them, have you encountered this? So I think making sure that researchers understand all those different methods of code sharing would be important. And I also think it might be interesting to uh, add in like a third perspective. So we have readers, authors, perhaps ask people, oh, do you peer review or are you an editor for a journal? So we can kind of capture that side of things. Like we know that uh, some of these tools really facilitate better peer review, but as, but as someone who's doing peer review or you know editing for a journal actually do you use them and are they helpful for you whereas you know so we really have that evidence base that uh, on the kind of journal side of things these things help as well um and i would just i think encourage openness from other other publishers i think you know the the way that we're going to improve open science is by sharing our practices and our results and being honest about um what works and, and what doesn't work and you know so, some publishers are, are willing to share those you know um around a session at the research data alliance conference in in the summer we had people from taylor and francis going you know we, we just got the workflow order wrong so we tried to encourage researchers to adopt these things but actually we were asking them at the wrong point at the time of submitting their paper and going through that process and those are all really valuable lessons as we try and work out actually how do we integrate these tools into this Kind of whole research publish uh, research process, not just the publishing process. So I think you know, although we all might be competitors, I think you know we're all looking at the same solutions and the, and and the same ways of increasing research. So I think by sharing, you know, it's not necessarily going to harm you against your competitors, but I think it could help improve everyone's implementation. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> um. So I think we'll uh, we'll move on now. Um, just a note to say that we've been tweeting the um, presentation slides. So if anyone follows um, at PJ uh, CompSci, um, <clears throat> you'll be able to see the slides slides there. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so we're going to move on to the final presentation now, which comes from Neil Chu Hong and Dan Katz, who led the software citation indexing and discoverability special issue. Neil Chu Hong is the director of Software Sustainability Institute and professor of research software policy and practice at the University of Edinburgh. Dan Katz is the chief scientist at the National Centre for Supercomputing Applications, the NCSA, and associate research professor at the University of Illinois. They'll be making use of the polls feature, so please engage with those that they appear on your screens. So over to you, Dan and Neil. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. I'm going to start sharing the slides and then let uh, Dan kick us off.
Okay, yeah, thank you, Neil. Okay, yeah, so um, so Neil and I are gonna talk um, about some of the basic work that was done for the special issue and uh, in advance of it, and kind of in, in some sense that the special issue is the maybe the culmination of, or at least a, a, a point of checking to see where we are today. Um, so should we go on? Okay, so first we'll do a poll um, and just try to see where everybody is today. Um, and if you click on the polls at the bottom, you should see, I think, this poll. And at least I can see one few people are answering now, so that's good. Uh, we'll, we'll wait a couple of minutes, give everybody a chance to answer or everybody that wants to. And I apologize for the shoveling noise, if you can hear that. Somebody decided to dig in the dirt outside my window right now. Okay, well, we've got about 20 response, huh? no, a little more, okay. Ah, oh, very sad, somebody's skeptical. We almost had no one skeptical. I was, I was thinking that was either encouraging or selection bias, but. Okay, well, let's, so, so we'll stop now. So uh, the results, and I'm not sure if everybody can see the results, but just to basically say it's, a, it's like almost a perfect bell curve. Um, where we've got uh, one one skeptical result. Uh, well, I guess they're not quite in order. One unsure result, um, and then lots of people who are interested. Even slightly more people who are motivated, and then some people that are they're working on. Uh, so good good to see uh, interest and motivation and work, and then a little bit of skepticism and uncertainty, which we can hopefully uh, talk about a little as we go on, and or maybe some of that will get done as we from the other talks as well. All right, next. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so the work on software citation has been has been going on for a while. It, it kind of, in some sense, started in 2015 in terms of a formal group, although there was informal work before that. Um, and we've done a lot, but there still are some challenges. Uh, this, as I was saying before, is kind of a, a point to look back and see what's happened, uh, what are best practices now. Um, not just for citation, but also for actually dealing with the citations, whether that's indexing or, or using them for discovery. Um, the work that uh, that we're going to talk about here primarily started, as I said, in 2015 with the with a, with a pair of Force 11 working groups that were intended to develop best practice for authors and, and journals and others uh, around software citation. Um, and the group has come up with a bunch of different things, which are listed here, and I think we'll also talk about as we as we go on to some extent. So let's let's go on. Uh, so as I said before, the group started in in 2015. Um, we ended we had a bunch of different people from a bunch of different varieties of, of work, from researchers to developers to publishers to repositories to librarians. Um, and what we did in that first year was basically really to look at community practice and develop use cases in the context of the data citation principles, which had been published earlier. Um, and in 2016, then we we said, given that we have the data citation principles, how how should we update them um, based on this other work, based on the software use cases, based on the related work, uh, based on what the working group has talked about, and based on the feedback that we got in. Um, some online sessions, some uh, uh, asynchronous work, and then a couple of different workshops. Uh, and this led us to a paper on, on software citation principles that was published in, in PeerJCS um, after community review. And I'll say uh, for the PeerJ folks, um, I really liked the fact that we were able to uh, publish the reviews uh, and our response to the reviews as well, so that it was clear um, kind of how the paper had changed and what issues people thought about and how we responded to those issues. Okay, next. Okay, so um, so I think, yeah, so as I said, uh, we, we talked about these, these differences and defined um, really a set of software citation challenges as well. That was the other thing that really happened early in the group. So in order to, to do that, um, we had a uh, preprint that was a, kind of a community gathering of 
why do we need different citation principles for software than, than data? What, what are the differences between software and data in the context of citation, uh, which was published as a, a pure J preprint? Um, we did some initial work on a set of challenges uh, for, for software citation and what the what software citation could lead to. Um, and that was published in uh, ACM Journal of Data and Information Quality. And then, as I said before, then we also did publish the, the software citation principles themselves. Uh, this was all done by this, this working group that was uh, co-led by uh, Arfin Smith, uh, myself, and Kyle Niemeyer. Okay, next. Uh, so, so some of the things that, that came out of this are, um, are, are importance um, of software citation. Uh, and what we thought was the case, and I think what we still think is the case, is that software as, is as integral to a paper, or sorry, as integral as a paper or a data set in facilitating full understanding and dissemination of research. Um, one of the things that happened is we, we looked at how citation worked and, and the infrastructure for citation was basically built for books and journal articles, primarily for journal articles actually. Um, and this infrastructure makes those things easy to cite. And because the citations are easy and the indexing is well done, then they become uh, a key element within the process of research uh, really across all disciplines. Um, we want software uh, to be cited in the same way. Um, there are some challenges in doing this, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we go on. Uh, if we can do this successfully, though, this helps further research, and it provides a means for other researchers to access the software um, in order to, to do some of the things that Lauren was talking about, um, as well as uh, just the, the purpose of citation itself to, to give attribution and credit. Um, but then also to, to enable peer review, validation, reproducibility, uh, to support collaboration and reuse. If you can see somebody else's software, you might use it, you might decide to collaborate with them, um, and to encourage building on the work of others to try to, to reduce some of the uh, unnecessary duplication that happens in software often today. Um, if we can cite software using, using software citation, then that elevates the software to the level of first-class object. Uh, similar to papers and, and books and, and maybe data sets. Um, and that's consistent with the importance and the significance of software today. Uh, and we'll talk more about where software citation is uh, a little bit later. Next. Um, so the software citation principles are, are six. Um, and just to, to mention them briefly, uh, importance is basically saying, as, as we just said on the previous slide, that the idea of software citation itself is important. Uh, credit and attribution, again, as, as stated on the previous slide, is saying that one of the purposes of, of citation of software is to give credit and attribution to the developers of that software. Uh, unique identification is that you want to identify the, the software that was used in a work. Um, persistence is that the metadata, uh, the data about the cited software, um, should persist even if the software itself doesn't. For example, if you had the software on GitHub and you took it away, or you had the software on uh, a different platform that went away, uh, we'd like the, the metadata to stick around so that you can still identify what was done. Uh, accessibility says that the purpose of the, of the, a purpose of the citation ideally is to let the reader access the software. Uh, and specificity um, says that where there are multiple versions of software, you'd like the citation to point to the specific version that was actually used. Okay, next, please. Okay, so um, so having finished the, the principles paper, um, we did a bunch more work um, in another group that was the Software Citation Working Group. Um, and what that group originally was going to do was to uh, get people to endorse the principles, to develop sets of guidelines for implementing the principles, to actually help uh, people who wanted to implement the principles, and to test specific implementations of the principles. Um, I'm not sure that we've done all of those things, but we have done a lot of things, and they're in the next two columns, but I think we're going to go through them on the next few slides, so let's just go ahead and do them there. Okay, so again, um, I think uh, Neil and I and Martin, um, who led this, this next working group, the Software Citation Implementation Working Group, were potentially a little bit naive, or at least I was, 
uh, in starting this out and, and thinking that we just needed to write down a, a small amount of detail that would be necessary to implement the principles, then all these things would just happen. Um, and everybody was going to be really excited by this and really interested in this, and our job would be to try to coordinate what other people were doing. Um, and we might have to do some work to encourage some communities to actually implement the principles, but everybody, again, was going to be very, uh, very supportive and really want to do this. And, um, and, and so, unfortunately, we quickly realized that we were wrong, um, that the amount of detail needed was not small, uh, that there were different groups that were eager to move forward, um, but they were making progress in scattered areas, and this wasn't sufficient. And that there were some really uh, fundamental underlying challenges that nobody independently could address, and we needed to really uh, call out and then try to to work on. Um, and so we wrote a, a preprint um, in 2019 once we once we had this realization to try to identify exactly what those challenges were, and to talk about ways that they could be addressed. Okay, next please. Uh, and, and the challenges fall into two different categories. Um, there's a bunch of different technical challenges, and these um, basically, uh, I would say that they're basically related to two issues, one being diversity and one being metadata. And, and the diversity part has uh, kind of different factors. One is that um, there's a lot of different kinds of software from open source to closed source. There's different ways that software is uh, is shared, either uh, published through an archive or unpublished, but made available potentially through a, a source repository um, or through a package manager. Um, there's software that's versioned, there's software that's not versioned, there's software that is de developed by the person who wants to cite it, and then there's software that is developed by somebody else, but you still want to cite it. Uh, software can be in the form of services or containers or executables. And so this diversity then leads to a challenge of identification. Um, because we'd like to be able to uniquely identify software of each type and ideally as uniformly as possible. Um, but this is really hard because these kinds of software really are so diverse and where they're shared, where they're uh, stored is very diverse. Um, there is a joint Force 11 RDA software source code identification working group that worked on this. And I would say did not really lead to a, uh, a unifying conclusion in terms of here is what should be done, but more catalog the different things that were being done, uh, just to make people aware of them and to, um, I guess, to share ideas about uh, how they were similar and how they were different. Um, the other part then is, is metadata. And again, each type of software uh, needs metadata if it's going to be cited. and how that metadata is actually defined and where it's stored um, are fairly large challenges as well. Uh, once it's stored somewhere, it actually then needs to be accessed and, and converted potentially into different types, which also are challenges. Um, and then there's another kind of related piece, which is uh, that if, if an author has written multiple versions of software and those versions are, are all being cited independently, um, their citations in some sense are getting sliced up and they're not getting the same amount of credit they would for one publication. Um, and so it's important to think about how do you count citations across versions, uh, across multiple versions, where the authors of those versions may change over time. Uh, new, ver new authors may come in, old authors may go away. Um, and this led us to this realization that, that metadata really is fundamental to this uh, overall problem. On the social side, we need um, groups that are actually working on this implementation in context. And those groups can include disciplinary communities, and in some cases, societies, publishers, repositories, indexers, funders, and institutions. And those groups really need to come together and, and run pilots to establish norms. And so I think um, like Daniel's uh, talk earlier is really um, a good example of one of these communities coming together and trying to figure out best practices. Uh, and then continuing on to help each other. Okay, next please. Okay, so in response to those challenges, we decided to work through task forces. We used that as a model where we would define a task force to go off and, and do something, and the task force would work together to do it and then would dissolve. And in parallel, we could have multiple task forces or we could have multiple task forces in sequence. Um, the guidance task force that Neil led came up with uh, two checklists. One for uh, paper authors who want to cite software, and one for software developers who want to make their software citable. Uh, we also had a code meta task force, 
which was working in metadata. Um, there was an existing code meta project, which was building a, uh, a crosswalk of existing metadata standards for software with the idea of trying to understand how metadata worked for software. And this was metadata uh, writ large, not just metadata used for citation. Um, this project developed a code meta standard that, uh, that described software based on these crosswalks. Um, and so what the code meta task force has done is to update the code meta standard uh, to describe everything that's in code meta using schema.org properties. And the idea then is that code meta doesn't need to keep its own schema. It just needs to be a community group that has some governance that works with a, a subset of, of schema.org. Okay, next. Okay. Um, the software registries task force uh, was led by Alice Allen and that's what Daniel talked about. And so I'm not gonna say anything more about that. Uh, we had a journals task force that I led, which has been working with publishers first to provide generic guidelines for journals and conferences to provide to authors uh, with the idea that these journals and conferences then provide specific guidelines using community accepted language and examples and, and styles. Um, and so we published a paper on this in F1000 research uh, last year. And we are working with Chorus, which is a uh, industry, um, let's see, uh, representation group, representative group from the publishing industry uh, to create a software citation policy index that for each publisher lists the software citation policy that they have and, and links to it. So authors can, can look at this or publishers can look and see what each other have done. Um, we are also working on publication processing, which is really this question about uh, once the citation information goes to the publisher, once the author gives it to the publisher, what happens next? Um, how does the publisher actually deal with it in their own internal systems or more often in contractor systems so that this information doesn't lose any value or any content and is transferred to indices uh, correctly so that indices then know that this is software and can actually track citations uh, correctly. And Shelley Stahl has, is working on a, uh, a paper about this. Um, which should be sent to a publisher uh, any day now. Okay, next, please. Um, so then the, the last set of things that we did on these challenges was to consider an institutions task force, where we define institutions as the places that people work, uh, like universities and labs and industry and government, uh, with the idea that institutions have policies and practices and we would like to affect those policies and practices so that they better encourage software citation and that they uh, use software citation information within hiring and promotion. So what we thought we could do was to, to collect and share examples to help form communities, maybe to, to take language from one uh, institution and provide it to another with the idea that that institution could adopt some version of it. Um, but we did not have enough interest from the working group members. And so this uh, task force hasn't actually started yet, although it, it could if there were people interested here. Um, and then finally, uh, since this group has been actually going for about six years, we wanted to step back and, and see where we were um, and try to figure out what else makes sense to do and who can do it and, and even more who actually wants to do it. And so we had an uh, IMLS, uh, a government agency, uh, funded software citation workshop this summer um, that was laid, uh, led by Dana Quinn, uh, that was assessing and planning next steps. And there should be a report coming from this workshop um, early next year. And that, were, that report then will, will give us guidance about what the next steps are that we um, can think about new task forces or some other mechanism to implement. Okay, next. Okay, so another poll. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna read this. I'll just wait for people to, to click. Okay, so this is, um, I would say this one is reasonably positive as well. Uh, happy to see a plurality uh, using um, journal policies that include software citation and then uh, another number that are 
uh, aware of them, and then a, a smaller number that are not aware of them. Um, so that's that's good, although it does, of course, leave some some space for us to to work to continue working. Okay, let's go on. Okay, uh, and and so just because we're we're talking here with a publisher, we want to uh, under the auspices of a publisher at least, we wanted to kind of give a little bit more detail about this. Um, so this paper that came out last year on recognizing the value of software, um, I think there's a couple of things that are interesting to see. Uh, as I said before, this is guidance to journals and to conferences that's generic with the idea that those journals and conferences then will take this um, and will um, create specific examples that better fit their communities than the, than the generic guidance. Um, it's, uh, we had a number of different publishers, as you can see, both on the, on the right and on the left, that were involved in this um, right, as co-authors signing, uh, signifying their, their interest. Uh, and then we had a number of other stakeholders who are not publishers, but are involved in, um, uh, in other parts of the software citation ecosystem. And again, as I said, this was uh, mostly done in the context of journals, but we do intend it also to apply to conference proceedings where uh, where conferences do publish papers and, and things that, that do fit that should have citations. Okay, next please. And I think we're over to Neil. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So I'm going to take over and talk a little bit about what was in that paper and in the different checklists around the recommend, uh, recommended and optional items for software citation, uh, and then talk a little bit more about how software citation and its related parts around uh, referencing and indexing have all progressed over the last the last sort of decade that uh, Dan has been um, describing. So when we went through uh, the different recommendations for software citation. One of the key things was trying to provide guidance that could be used by other groups. So in, in the case of this paper, principally journals, journal editors and publishers, that was clear, unambiguous and easy to implement. And so one of the things that came out of this was a relatively short list of recommended items for, uh, for structuring software citations. And so what we have here is basically five pieces of metadata. Uh, one is the creator of the software. And here we've moved away from using the term author to be clearer that it's the, it could be the authors um, as in the individuals, but it could also be a project that develops the software. The second is the title, which is the name of the software and probably the thing that is the most human readable um, piece of metadata for identifying the software. The publication venue, uh, which is probably an archive or repository that's providing a persistent identifier to that software. The date that the software was published, which might be unknown. Uh, and this is the date associated with the release of the version of the software, not the date at which the software was used. And then finally, the identifier, which is some sort of pointer to the software, preferably uh, a persistent identifier. And as Dan has mentioned, there's still a lot of discussion going on in the community about the different types of identifiers for software. Quite often we're seeing digital object uh, identifiers being used similar to data sets, but there are a whole set of other persistent identifiers that are being used for software as well. In many cases, there's not a persistent identifier for software. And so in those cases, we're recommending that uh, the people who are writing a paper uh, or the people who are checking the paper uh, make sure that there's a URL to where the software exists as the best possible identifier if there's not a persistent identifier with associated metadata. There were also a few things that we were considering and eventually uh, ended up making optional. Uh, so one of these is version. And I know there's been some discussion in the earlier presentations around how to, how to handle identification of versioning. Um, so here uh, we, we consider that it's useful uh, to have the identifier for the version of the software being referenced, but in many cases that might be unknown. Um, in that case, this is where you might use the date of access. 
Um, so uh, we had the date metadata uh, field on the previous slide, but in this case here, this is the point at which the author of the paper has used the software rather than when the software was published. And then finally, we recognize that in some citation styles, there are um, other fields uh, that represent the type. So for instance, um, in APA style, they have a bracketed description saying computer software, uh, and that might be useful to include uh, when, uh, where appropriate. The other thing that we put into this guidance was a recommendation around how to, um, how to cite software where you have both an article and also the software itself. So, uh, if you've got a paper that describes the software, our recommendation is that it should be cited as an additional reference, as well as citing the software itself. So always cite the software, and if the article exists, also cite the article. Um, what we're trying to get away from is the practice of citing the article instead of the software. And I think that's one of the kind of key changes that, um, that is uh, gradually happening, but I think still has quite a long way to go in the community. And it's it's probably the thing that will, um, in terms of credit, make the biggest difference around how we appreciate and value software. Because if we always substitute an, uh, the article for the software, it's kind of saying that we value the article more than we value the software. So here's some of the examples of how this looks like, both in terms of the in-text uh, citation and the reference in the reference section, uh, again, taken from the uh, guidance paper that uh, Dan mentioned earlier. And so we, we see that there's basically a couple of places where software citations tend to come up. Um, one is in the related work section, where it might be that um, there's a comparison being made with other pieces of software. And then the other is in the methodology section, where what um, you're trying to do is describe the tools that were being used to perform your research. And here we have four different examples. The first one's uh, an example of what we call a software concept. So it is here a lot of different versions of software, but taken um, as a whole, because what we're doing is a, is a general comparison, uh, in this case to BLAS. Uh, the second one is for a piece of commercial software. So here we're trying to pers uh, persuade people to cite not just um, open software, but also uh, closed and commercial software. Uh, and in this case, it's one where only the executable is available. So it's being cited almost like an instrument is being cited uh, in, in other areas. Um, the third one's what we might consider to be an ideal um, citation, where what we have here is a citation that is pointing directly to an archive in Zenodo, and then um, alongside its version as well. And then finally, the fourth one is, uh, and we've discussed here um, how you cite something for, for R, this one's using a recommended citation. So this is the, the one that is recommended by the authors themselves. Um, and so it's a case of where um, you're looking to provide as much information here as possible, but following the, uh, the tool makers or the software um, authors preferences. So um, we would be amiss if we weren't to describe the how these sort of guidance have been taken up by uh, different journals and in particular PRJ as the host of this uh, webinar and also the host of this special issue. And it has been great working with Graham and his team to look and see how the PRJ computer science policies can be adapted and revised to help support software citation and software in general. And so there's a number of things that are now in the code and data availability policy and in the instructions to authors that help to, um, to basically ensure that people are aware of the reasons for doing things um, and also encourage this change in behavior. So um, one, one of the things in the code and data availability policy is um, like many other journals are moving towards uh, is that recognition that software needs to be included uh, along with the submission of the paper and made available. Uh, but also here, uh, this, um, this uh, mandatory requirement to ensure that software that 
is third party software used by the authors is cited appropriately. And so here, this is really about ensuring that we are giving credit to the uh, authors of the software that we're using as researchers. Um, there's also some uh, guidance given in the instructions for authors to help them understand how they can do some of this. So for example, um, pointing out that DOIs for software can be created by many free services such as Zenodo, um, that uh, there may be a persistent identifier already available in things like software heritage for third party um, uh, or author written um, and deposited software. And again, making sure that it's really clear that um, as part of the submission policies, um, that third party code that's being used must be acknowledged. And that this is the, um, this is the responsibility of the author, uh, not just uh, for the, uh, the software providers, the third party software to make it clear. So the authors have to make all reasonable attempts to ensure that uh, they can point their readers to where that third party software could be found. Um, and as Dan said, uh, one of the things that is now happening is that Chorus is tracking the different policies that have been put in place by different publishers. And so it provides a, a simple place where you can look and see what the different policy statements are on software availability um, and see if any of those have uh, a note on how you should cite software as well. So I'm now going to go on and talk a little bit about uh, some of the progress towards software citation and indexing uh, and see how things have changed. Um, in 2016, a lot of you will be aware of this um, paper from uh, James Harrison and Julia Bullard uh, on software in the scientific literature, which was one of the first studies to really look and see how software was being mentioned in um, scholarly communications. And one of the things that they identified was that there were lots of different ways in which software was mentioned in papers. Uh, some of these were formal citations, um, so maybe citations to uh, publications, uh, to user manuals, or perhaps to project websites. And others were um, more informal mentions. So they might be mentioned just as a URL in the text pointing to a web page or a repository um, or just the name of the software itself. Um, in some cases, it, it wasn't even um, named as a piece of software. All that was clear was that software was used in the paper. And this particular study has really been used as the basis for a lot of work that's followed on that has improved the way in which software um, citation um, discoverability and indexing has been improved and how research in this area has improved. So in 2019, a paper was published that looked at software citation in the data citation index. And here the interest was to understand, given that uh, a lot of software was being published in repositories that were already being indexed by Clarivate Analytics Data Citation Index, because they were data repositories, to see whether or not there was a widespread um, uh, kind of like uh, citation um, of software, and also whether there was any reuse of software that could be identified. Um, and here, what's what's kind of clear is firstly that uh, the um, the sort of citation counts are increasing. So the graph on the right is adapted from data that's available in that paper that shows that the overall um, number of software citations per year based on the top four repositories is definitely increasing. And a lot of that is being driven by repositories such as Zenodo, um, which are seeing a large number of software deposits. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that uh, whilst there's, there's uh, increasing use of these uh, large third party repositories, there doesn't seem to be the same usage of institutional repositories, um, which are being relatively well used for, for other types of output, but perhaps not for software. And that's maybe something that uh, is of interest to look at in terms of uh, further research. Certainly, I know from my own institution repository that a kind of a key problem is understanding how to provide guidance. 
um, for uh, researchers at my institution to deposit software in it. And I think that kind of comes back to Dan's mentioning of the institutional task force and that perhaps a missing link to improve this particular piece of software discoverability is to somehow understand how we can um, provide guidance and increase the number of people who are interested in doing this um, from in different institutions across the world. Another piece of work that's been done uh, recently is by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, who have created a model to extract and disambiguate uh, software mentions from the uh, biomedical literature. Uh, this is in, this is kind of based on work that again um, was going alongside some of the work that was mentioned earlier today uh, by um, uh, previous speakers but also in terms of work that had been done by CZI themselves. And I think the kind of key thing that uh, I take from this paper is firstly, that there's a lot of software that's being mentioned in uh, the literature. Uh, so um, we, we see that in one particular, in the largest of their, their kind of um, uh, data sets, they've managed to find about one, uh, what is it, um, 97,600 unique software entities uh, across effectively 1.1 um, million mentions. And this is in two and a, uh, nearly two and a half million papers. So we're seeing, we're seeing a mention in every other paper, which uh, is, is perhaps uh, very similar to what was presented earlier in Lauren's talk. Um, and I think the kind of key thing here is that now, it's becoming easier to understand and extract the software that's being used in, um, in uh, academic research. And so it should become easier to build upon this and look at more research into discoverability. Um, and so uh, a couple of final things. Um, one of these is looking at what's happened in terms of support in different infrastructures. Uh, so in 2021, um, there was the addition of uh, software citation support in GitHub, one of the most popular code repositories used by researchers. Uh, and uh, this, which is taken from a uh, talk that was being given by Stefan Driskat uh, recently, and I know he's, he's one of the people who's been um, participating in this call, shows that there really has been a, a huge growth and a huge linear growth in the uh, use of citation files within software repositories in, in GitHub. Uh, and I think the kind of key thing that's really interesting is how much that information has been used. So um, we've, we've still got a relatively small number of projects compared to the number of software projects, for instance, in Zenodo. Uh, but that information has been used over 1.2 million times now. Uh, and I think if we are to change the way in which um, software citation is, is uh, used by everyday researchers, we've got to make it simple and we've got to make it um, free of barriers. And so with that, the last thing, um, which is aiming to get around one particular uh, barrier that uh, Dan mentioned briefly in terms of metadata is also uh, a recommendation uh, for how software citation information is handled in JATS for R, which is um, a kind of the key way in which uh, software, uh, sorry, not software, in which um, publication metadata is published and passed on between different systems. And so this basically means that uh, we hope that uh, software citation metadata isn't lost or mangled as much as it goes between the journals um, and the indexes. So finally, um, one last thing to note uh, is that uh, this year also saw the publication of the FAIR principles for research software. And whilst the FAIR principles for research software do not directly um, describe how to do software citation. If you think back to the uh, software citation principles that Dan first published at the start, uh, there are a lot of these that overlap in intent. Um, and those are, are basically the ones I've put in red here. So, so what we can see is that to create FAIR software, um, 
you do want to make software that is citable. Um, and also, if you if you follow the software citation principles, you are helping the fairness of research software. So these two sets of principles are mutually compatible. And what we'd hope is that uh, the uh, the uptake and adoption of both go hand in hand. So um, final poll before we uh, we finish this presentation and go to questions. And that is, uh, what is the largest remaining challenge related to software citation? And so there's a number of different options here um, from lack of suitable guidance, lack of suitable tools, lack of suitable policy, lack of effort or resources to implement, lack of offer demand, um, not yet supported by infrastructure, confusion over identifiers, confusion over metadata formats, or something else. Um, and if you'd like to put in something else, uh, or indeed you've got a secondary um, thing, which is something else, please do put that into the Q&A. Unfortunately, due to the, the limitations of the Zoom polling, we can't have just a, a free text version. So if you'd, like to, if you'd like to explain actually for any of the categories here, um, what you think the challenge is, uh, please do put those into the Q&A and um, we, can, we can discuss these after this talk. And so I can see here that there's there's a fairly even spread across different um, options. Um, there's maybe more uh, people who are indicating that it's a lack of suitable guidance. So it might be interesting to discuss what guidance it is that uh, they're looking for. Um, some of it is about not being supported by the infrastructure. Uh, the only thing that doesn't have a vote so far is, is basically um, confusion over identifiers. Uh, so maybe um, Dan and I's uh, worries that uh, all of the different identifiers will cause problems isn't a big problem and people are just happy to use whichever identifier they're given. Or, or maybe it's just not the biggest problem. <laughs> That's true. That's true. OK, um, so I'm just going to sh stop there and um, we'll just wrap up this presentation. So in conclusion, uh, I think um, one of the things that that this has shown us is that over the last seven, eight years, we've really managed to raise the profile of software citation with many different stakeholder groups. Um, I think just seeing the sorts of papers that have come out uh, the way in which software citation is being talked about shows that amongst most of the stakeholder groups, perhaps not institutional stakeholders, but everyone else, software citation is being discussed uh, and people are, are generally interested in trying to take something forward. Um, there's a lot of good work that's been done, which is starting to have effects. Uh, and in particular, the guidance work uh, for, for lots of different types of stakeholders is being adopted and we're starting to see the implementation and the impact of that. Um, some of the tracking is still a research challenge. So I think if we were to rerun a new special issue that looked on at this in five years time, I mean, one of the things is really understanding uh, how we can determine what, what has been the most effective way of improving software citation. Um, because it's really difficult at a time where software usage has also gone up um, dramatically. And there are a lot of other challenges. Uh, I think one of the kind of key ones uh, is perhaps where and how metadata should be stored and how it should be provided. Uh, and also what should be cited. Uh, so we still we still are unclear around the the relative merits of software papers versus software repositories versus software archives, um, and and basically what's what are the current um, desired intentions from authors and what might be the things that they would be interested in in using and citing in the future. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll hand back over. Um, we're happy to take uh, questions now, or um, we're also happy to be contacted outside of this. Uh, and um, a big thank you to all of the members of the Force 11 Software Citation Working Group, the Software Citation Implementation Working Group, and all of the task forces that have been running as part of this. 
Great, thank you very much, both of you. <clears throat> um, I had one question. We've got a couple of questions in the uh, Q and A as well. Um, I was wondering what you thought is the the best or possibly most effective way of spreading awareness of the principles of software citation. So I, I guess uh, so. I'll, maybe I'll answer, and Neil has a different answer. We'll see. Um, I think it's a question really of of stakeholders, and and so I don't think that there is a a most effective way, but it's really working with different stakeholders in the way that works for them. Um, and so in the case of authors, uh, people that are writing papers, I think it's primarily by working through through publishers because that's the the, the bottleneck that all papers have to flow through in some sense. Um, in the uh, in the case of software developers, um, that one's a little bit less clear uh, because there there isn't really a, a means of communication to software developers in general. There's like lots of different means. So I I think publishers is one one clear way um, of doing this. The other, I guess, the other thing that uh, affects researchers, at least in academia, is funders. And so trying to work through funders as well, I think, can be successful. Um, I know there's some some one of the questions mentions the UK ref and so in in countries that have uh, uh, institutional uh, maybe institution uh, government policies about research assessment potentially that would be another way but that's yeah. not my situation in the US so um, I broadly agree with with what Dan has said there I think additionally um, there's there's one thing that we can do about encouraging reviewers in journals to to look at this. Um, I know that this is this can be quite difficult because I'm I'm guessing that in many cases uh, reviewers in journals don't generally look at uh, the reference lists and check through to make sure that they're properly formatted. But of the, I think this is maybe kind of um, uh, going to the the the. It's indirectly related to something that Lauren mentioned about there's a small group of people who really care about doing things better. And so there's there's also a small group of um, people who are reviewers for journals who really care about doing something better. And perhaps that's another little point at which we can improve adoption is by having them gently but firmly pushing back and saying, uh, no, we we expect to see um, your your code being made available, and we expect you to see uh, credit being given to the authors of the software that you're using through citation. Um, shall I answer the question around from yeah. Domino Harlan about? Can I just jump in for one second on that? Um, because I think that I think the the point that you're making, Neil, I think is great, and I'd like to just expand it slightly. And, and say that for anybody that's on this, that's a reviewer of anything, um, one thing that you can do is to is to talk about citation when you're reviewing, if you're reviewing a proposal, and if you're reviewing a conference, if you're reviewing somebody's promotion, if you're reviewing bringing a new student in, um, in, in all these cases, it's an opportunity to talk about what you think is valuable. Sorry, Neil, back to you. Yeah, okay. So I uh, yeah so I, I'll, I'll take um, Donald's question about uh, which is quite UK focused, um, but I think it's it's maybe part of a, a more general question around uh, the the way that software is considered uh, in terms of reporting policy and maybe um, also the value that's placed in terms of uh, a whole set of different things within research, um, principally around applying for funding. So the question there is, um, with the very low UK REF 21 returns for software, uh, would the panel have any comments on the role of the university institutional repository uh, within citation of software, along with the code and archival repositories? Um, so particularly with its importance in REF eligibility and fundamental respect for research software's legitimate output. Um, I, I've been involved as well in something called Hidden Ref, uh, which has been looking at all of the things that aren't well, um, well submitted in Ref. And Ref is the uh, research evaluation framework. It is an exercise that is run periodically in the United Kingdom that aims to judge the quality of research that is being submitted by different institutions. Um, and effectively, it is responsible for about 20% of the research funding that goes into these, these different higher education institutions. So it's quite important. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed is that although there's been a category for submitting um, software for some time, 
if anything, the uh, proportion of software that is being submitted compared to the proportion of other outputs, it's diminishing over time, despite the, the number of pieces of software that are being um, used and being associated with publications increasing over time. And in many cases, we believe this is because uh, software, um, because um, there isn't a proper understanding of how to rate and assess the quality of software, people are afraid of putting it in because it might affect the funding that they get. So, so what, what's this with, um, what can we do in terms of the way that we look at uh, the role of the institutional repository? I think the kind of key thing here is to make it easier for people to just as a matter of, um, as a matter of their general sort of research project good practice and discipline to enable them to easily archive software into their institutional repository in the same way that they're archiving their data sets. Um, there hasn't been a huge increase in data sets uh, submitted in REF in proportion to the total number of outputs, but at least there has been an increase. So I think I think by making it easier, that will be really important. Um, the, the other thing there perhaps is uh, in terms of what you mentioned around uh, alongside the kind of code and archival repositories. And I noticed there's another question later on, um, which is which is around uh, how do we how do we deal with the whole um, archive, citing an archive repository, but also wanting to point people to the living repository and the code repository. Because in many cases, authors care about directing people to the um, code repository, because that's how they get additional collaborators and additional users, whereas um, uh, some other stakeholders care about um, pushing it to the um, archive, because that is more useful for reproducibility and more generally for preserving the, uh, the knowledge that is enshrined in a paper. Um, and so that's that's still a really interesting question. Um, I realize I've been talking for a little while. I don't know, Dan, if you have a perspective on the the whole um, pointing to a code repository versus pointing to a preservation or archive repository. Yeah, um, I, I was going to actually uh, add on to that to the answer that you were giving, which I think is exactly right in terms of um, kind of people's interests and the, the motivations. Um, one interesting thing which we haven't talked about, or at least I didn't hear about, and I, I came in a few minutes late, so maybe it was earlier, uh, is, uh, is software heritage. Um, and, and software heritage, for those that don't know, is, is basically a uh, like an internet archive for open source software that's capturing what's happening in, in open source repositories and, and preserving it long term. Um, and it has its own uh, identifier, uh, kind of identifiers, uh, software heritage IDs. And the software heritage ID has both um, both things in it. Actually, it has a link to the archived version of the software as well as a link to the to the live place where the repository is. Um, and so I think that's really one of the interesting things about it. Um, on the negative side, it's an incredibly huge ID and it's horrible to type. Um, and it seems like there could be lots of errors that could come in, um, but it does have that advantage. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that there's a couple of different groups that I've heard talking about lately this exact issue that Neil was saying um, and, and suggesting that the answer maybe is actually to cite both in the references, both uh, the current version um, in, in the repository as well as an archival version um, that, that would satisfy both of those use cases. Uh, and then when that discussion happens, then it leads to questions about, uh, about how many citations a paper can have and why publishers want to uh, limit the number of citations. And, and it gets down to a kind of a long uh, discussion. I, I guess kind of following on from that very briefly, it, they are there are possibly different purposes for um, for those two different sorts of citation, and maybe maybe that's kind of where we go towards, which is um, uh, almost that the citation to the archive one is the way that you get credit, but the citation or reference um, to the the code repository is the way that you get collaborators, and because those two purposes are different, that they can coexist. Um, uh, potentially even in, in different ways of referencing. Um, so it might be the difference between a, a reference in, in the reference list versus a footnote. Um, the, the other thing I, I would kind of say on, um, before I, I kind of 
uh, bring Daniel in as well is that uh, I I, I feel like when, we, when we're looking at the software heritage thing, the interesting thing for that, for me, is that that takes the uh, place of the archive repository, not the living code repository. But in some cases, I've seen it being, um, being sort of promoted as being uh, uh, alternative to the living code repository. And I think that's maybe muddling things a little bit because they both look like code repositories. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, Daniel? Yeah. Yes, I am. I wanted. Oh, uh, we can't hear you anymore. Can you hear me? Hello. You you're now very quiet. Very quiet. Okay. Uh, there we okay. go. Um, we can hear you a little now. Okay. Um. I I don't know. Um. <laughs> I'll try to be quick then. So, what what happens with the uh what the way authors want others to cite their work and what happens if the way authors want others to cite their work is conflicting to what we have seen in the guidelines yeah we so i i was just involved a couple of weeks ago in a uh, software citation workshop for high energy physics where we got people from the, the big experiments to come in and talk about their policies and then people that were software developers that were used in, in analysis and in production of data to talk about what they wanted. Uh, and then people from the indexing service and people from Zenodo, um, so a lot, and uh, some, a couple of people from journals as well. Um, and it was interesting because that what you're suggesting is exactly what happened, that um, that the, the field is overall is led by uh, people that are senior faculty members at universities. And they think that what's important is to have publications and they would like those publications to be cited and some software developers who are in that environment kind of listen and, and agree and think that they would like their publications to be cited um, but they also recognize that in some cases the software publication that's cited is one from 10 years ago and almost none of those authors who are getting credit are actually involved and all the new people are not getting any credit when that paper is cited and so they realize that there's a problem um, but they're not exactly sure how to solve that problem because it conflicts with the overall culture. And so I think it's this, this interesting challenge about wanting to change, uh, effectively wanting to change the culture of a, of a field, and at least in one aspect, where you have pressure to continue the old practice, even though people know that a new practice might have advantages. Um, there was, <clears throat> sorry, there was another question a moment ago, um, which was, do you advocate for a software availability statement similar to date to the data availability statement from some journals uh, that are including in their author guidelines? Okay, um, I guess I can try this, uh, unless Neil, if you want to. Okay. I mean, uh, I guess for me, yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm still not sure. I'm still not sure how I feel about whether these should all be separate statements. Um, and there has been some discussion about: Do you just make sure that the the intent is put in whichever uh, policy is most recognizable to the community that um, is is being served by that journal? But in general, the my view is yes, that should go in somehow. Yeah, and I guess my view is a little bit different in that I. I almost think that it shouldn't be called out as a special section, and I'm not even sure that data availability should be called out as a special section. But, um, but I do agree with the purpose of it that the that, that should be discussed within the paper. But to me, it's it's probably more in the in the method section as well as in the citations, as opposed to like being something that's completely uh, different than the main paper. Great, thank you very much. Um, oh, Lauren has a question. Yeah, sorry, just a, a point on those uh, availability statements. I, this is a really interesting question, something I think about a lot. Um, uh, I think we also have to be mindful that, you know, there are efforts to share other types of outputs and, you know, materials as well. Um, so we could end up, you know, with a long list of different statements and perhaps we use kind of one overarching statement. But as a publisher, I think it's really, 
um, useful to have those kind of outputs captured in the statement, especially if we can make sure that's kind of tagged in the XML of the article. Um, when I talked about the kind of that cross computational biology work we did to assess the code generation rates and the code sharing rates, having those statements kind of tagged and kind of flagged within the, the article metadata was really useful in terms of identifying when things have been shared. So, you know, although researchers' primary um, concern is in compliance, having, having those things kind of flagged is really useful for people like funders and publishers and institutions to kind of assess that compliance or assess, or assess the, the adoption of those practices, which is really, you know, what we're, we want to look at rather than compliance. Yeah, I have to say, I kind of like the, what seems to be happening, at least in, in some conferences and maybe some journals in computer science with both IEEE and ACM going to, to badging um, that basically has three levels of the right of the artifact has been made available, the, the artifact has been verified to be available, and the, the work is reproducible. Um, and I think the use of artifact is maybe is better than than having code or data or other things kind of like having a or the data management plan and the software management plan and the something else management plan eventually may not make sense and we may just want to have some kind of, I don't know, resource management plan or something. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's sort of the questions. Well, there is the other, sorry, go ahead, Neil. Uh, I, I was gonna say, I can see that Lindsay has raised their hand, I think to, ask a question. Sure, I can. There we go. Hi. So along these lines, this doesn't exist, but I kind of wish that there was a, a reproducibility or dependency statement instead of data and code availability, right? So like really those things all center around what are the dependencies to interpret what this report is saying, whether it's in an article or whether you're using software. And so that's a word I don't hear a lot and see a lot, but there are no sections that say dependencies, which to me, that's the most valuable component right off the bat. So I didn't know if anyone had any thoughts about that or sort of how that's looked at or discussed with software. I'll let Daniel respond to that because I can see his hands gone up. Yeah, I, I it's, uh, it's an answer to Lindsay. I, I participated as a reviewer a couple of years as a reviewer in a conference where they had the reproducibility track, right? And, and what we wanted to do in that effort was um, an effort to interact with the authors to make sure that we had managed to reproduce the methods that they were speaking or they were talking about in their papers. You cannot imagine the amount of effort that it takes, even though some of the um, approaches may be uh, fresh out, you know, and you have the support from, from the authors. Even when you have containers to ensure reproducibility or there are um, uh, notebooks, and the, the, if you want to go step by step and, and try to reproduce some of the, some of the work, especially, well, um, in my, my background is in computer science, it really takes a long time. And the question there is who is willing to put that, that time and that effort, especially when the reviewers never get any credit for it. Yeah, I, um, that, I think that was kind of the lines that I was talking about with, uh, with the IEEE and the, and the ACM uh, badging. Um, I'm the Artifacts co-chair for a conference that's gonna happen in, uh, May or June. Um, and so we're just now going through the policy about how to do this. And we're wrestling with the same issues that, that Danny was just saying about how to, uh, partly how to find reviewers, how to give them something that's worthwhile, but then also not to to make them put, um, I don't know, multiples of the, of the effort that they would put into reviewing the paper. I mean, the, I would say the one advantage that happens is you don't need as many reviewers for the artifact as you do for the paper, um, but, one may not be enough. Yeah. Three we, did it, we did it with just one, and I think it, it worked great. And I'm not complaining about, about the effort that it takes, but although I'm, it's just something to take into account. Um, what I'm a little bit more complaining a little bit more is that 
to me, uh, uh, after spending a lot of time reviewing, then I saw that 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 effort was like kind of diluted. Like it was, um, you couldn't see any special recognition to the papers that had gone through that effort or, and maybe that's part of the things that we can enforce, no? That, hey, well, like a special award, <laughs> I don't know, for the things that have been actually verified and are reproducible and you get a special distinction. Otherwise, why would people bother to go through that effort, not only from the reviewer point of view, but also from the author point of view, that they have to assist a person that are not familiar at all with their system, go through each of the steps that they had to go uh, to set everything up. Yeah, just to just to say one a couple of things really quickly about this, then I unfortunately I'm going to have to to leave. Um, but uh, so one one is that the ideally this there should be badges that appear on the paper, and uh, in, in these cases that you get somewhere between one and three badges um, for this, and so there is some distinguishing feature that the paper gets, and and the hope would be that readers actually trust the paper more depending on what those badges are. Um, the other thing on the reviewer side is I I don't have a great answer for that. From, from these points, but I do feel like um, in the Journal of Open Source Software, which I'm involved with, um, we're doing a good job with acknowledging reviewers by, uh, by posting their names as part of the work, um, by specifically thanking them. And, and sometimes in some years, we've actually given awards for, right, for best review or most reviews or, or other things like that as well. So hmm. yeah. I guess peer in some sense is giving points for reviewers, which is a our coins. I sorry, I don't remember what the right term is, but a, a different kind of reward. Yeah, tokens. I, I, yeah, I do certainly think that that that's kind of like a key thing of recognizing that reviewers are a value part of the system. So I was going to kind of touch on one last thing um, that was raised by Lindsay's question, um, and I think it's for me for me reproducibility is always pragmatic. Uh, I, I think that in most cases, we're not actually trying to um, we're not actually trying to to computationally completely reproduce things. So, so the question is, what's the balance in a reproducibility statement or a data and software availability statement to give um, enough information to the, re to the interested reader to allow them to take the, the first steps of reproducing on their own without making it so that it is a simple one-click reproducibility because I think one-click reproducibility of that sort is too difficult to to do sustainably. Um, I think it puts pressures in many other parts of the system. Um, and the thing I wanted to to pick up on was what you mentioned in another of your questions, Lindsay, around around linkages with data sets in particular. And I think there is something we could do there in our data and software statements or in a reproducibility statement about giving that little bit of additional context around how the software and the the um, data sets relate to each other that goes beyond what's just in the methodology and becomes maybe a little bit more machine readable um, and there is something in the fair principles uh, for research software about that but it is it is a principle that basically says uh, you know, you should be you should be using linked identifiers, and so I think there's still work to be done in the community to understand what people are comfortable with there to improve the linkage um, and the sort of semantic understanding between the the software and the data that's that's shown in those availability statements. If I, if I could just come in on, on that point, Neil. I think that re that also speaks to that question we had around um, institutions and what they can do to kind of facilitate, you know, software citation, software sharing, and that you know we need to recognise that a, a lot of research is really collaborative. You're going to have different people, say, collecting the data versus creating the software, and that you know there's a really important role for institutions. And I say this coming from uh, someone who worked as a research support in an institution prior to, to my current job. You know, there's a real, I think, role for it for institutional support for you know libraries or whoever's kind of helping facilitate these open practices to really talk about these and make sure that there is joined up um, understanding you know from research software engineers to the researchers to even the people in the research office who are then having to report back on these outputs that these things are all interlinked and they all need to be kind of uh, linked together and talked about and, and recognized by by every actor in that system. 
Yeah, it is interesting that um, a paper from the software citation um, working group to the LIBER conference of, of uh, basically research libraries in Europe last year won the most innovative paper award. So there's clearly there's clearly something that the research libraries want to do there. Um, and it's a case of understanding understanding what's possible given the, the shrinking budgets. Great, thanks. Um, I think that's about all we have time for, so we'll, we'll wrap up now. Um, thank you again very much to all the presenters. Um, you can check out all of their papers on the PJ, sorry, from the PJ Computer Science Special Issue through the link I've just posted in the chat. <clears throat> There'll also be a, a direct link to the special issue in the email to attendees tomorrow. Uh, and we will upload this webinar to our YouTube channel, so um, check that out. Um, a big thank you again to Dan and Neil for their consultation and advice when updating the PJ code and data availability policies across all, all of our journals. Um, so the, the big update there is that researchers must now provide version specific DOIs for their code and data sets um, if they haven't uploaded them as a supplemental file. Specific DOIs are also created for the supplements to PHA papers, so these can be um, directly cited as well. And this policy change will make it easier for researchers to directly cite software and in turn help ensure that code authors are appropriately acknowledged for their contributions. Um, if you have an idea for a special issue or a piece of open source software, research software that you'd like to publish, please get in touch with me, uh, graham at peerj.com or make a submission at peerj.com slash new. Um, thank you all for attending. Please keep your eyes on our social media channels for the latest cool, completely open access research from PJ Computer Science. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks.